Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Thomas. Thomas, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Can you please introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Yes. Hi, my name is Thomas Mayer. I am an investigative reporter for Newsday, have been for many years, but I'm primarily a, rep- uh, a book writer for the purposes of this show. I've written uh, seven books. Uh, a lot of the books have been about the Kennedys, and so I'm happy to talk about the Kennedys, just about any aspect of their lives. I know there was one book in particular I'd like to talk about, which is The Mafia Spies, but when it just comes to writing about the Kennedys, where exactly did you start and where's your focus at? Are are they the same? Did you start off and then end up diving into anything else? Right. Well, I am, as I mentioned, I'm a reporter for Newsday. And so uh, generally I've been writing uh, for a living, but uh, in college, I took a class. I went to Fordham in the Bronx, and I took a class about biographies, uh, American biographies, and I found that to be a great course. And ultimately, my book writing career has been about America in our times. So the first book I wrote was about the Newhouse, Condé Nast Media Empire, and it was about this very rich family, the Newhouse family that owns the various different magazines, but it was about the media. The second book I did was a, a much more of a traditional biography about the baby doctor, uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock. And his life was fascinating. It was almost like Forrest Gump. Uh, it, was, it embraced so much of the 20th century. But when I finished that book, I have a, growing up, despite my last name of Mayer, a uh, Germanic last name, fundamentally, when you say, how do you self-identify? I fundamentally grew up in an Irish Catholic background. Uh, and I was often given that background. Uh, I've often been curious about the Kennedy's Irish Catholic uh, background, their immigrant background, particularly you know going all the way back. But how the the Kennedys were essentially the the epitome or the uh, uh, or really representative of the Irish Catholic experience in America. Uh, The number one issue of the 1960 campaign, when John Kennedy uh, was running for president, the number one issue was his Catholicism, whether or not America, it's almost hard to believe these days, but uh, would America accept a Catholic in the White House? And that was the number one issue uh, of that campaign. In fact, uh, the New York Times, they did a a survey of... of, uh, uh, of their various different editors and reporters. And they asked them what was the top issue of that campaign. And it was uh, JFK's Catholicism. So I thought that uh, it would be really interesting to look of, of all the different Kennedy books, they've talked about uh, somewhat about his Irish background, somewhat, somewhat about his Catholic background, but they never really dived into the whole subject. And I looked at uh, the, the Kennedy family in general uh, through that prism. And when you, uh, when you do that, you, particularly when you look at the cultural background of somebody who is the first arguably minority president of the United States, uh, you know, the, the template for JFK's election in 1960 was something that, say, Romney, who was a Mormon when he ran, was aware of when Hillary Clinton, when she was running as a woman, she uh, was aware that she would be a barrier breaker. And of course, uh, Barack Obama's campaign, uh, uh, successful campaign, uh, and how he dealt with that as a minority, a person from a minority background. Uh, Really, the template was written by JFK. And so uh, when I looked at uh, the, the experiences of the Kennedys, it's really fascinating because they've they often felt for all their money and such that they were outsiders. 
And I got access to the Joe Kennedy papers. Joe Kennedy was the patriarch of the Kennedy family. He was a man who uh, did have that chip on his shoulder of uh, feeling that he was an outsider, even though he became one of the wealthiest people in the United States. He, would, he had a remarkable ability to make money. Uh, and so that was kind of the motor in the car, if you will, for the Kennedy family. Uh, and he, when he died, he, his papers were held by the family for uh, literally decades until around 2000, when they became available to researchers like myself. It's one of the first people to look at the Joe Kennedy papers uh, up, at the, up at the JFK library. And those papers were absolutely crucial to providing insights into the first book. That first book that I wrote came out in 2003, uh, the first book about the Kennedys. Uh, and that came out in 2003. It was called The Kennedys, America's Emerald Kings. Uh, and uh, actually, I wanted to call it originally The Emerald Kings. That's how, I, how much I wanted to play upon the whole idea of the Irish idea of, of uh, uh, the Irish kings and, and, and also kind of play off of the whole Camelot image, imagery in the United States here, which is really incredibly foolish. Uh, it's a concoction of the media after the death of JFK. Uh, and it just happens, uh, it happened because Jackie Kennedy mentioned something about uh, Kennedy listening to uh, uh, a Broadway play called Camelot just before he, he died and the writer Teddy White who was doing this interview for Life Magazine, I believe it was, um, picked it up as a theme and said this was the court of the round table and, and such. But the idea that the Kennedy family should be uh, uh, inflicted with the metaphor of Camelot is it's really funny because Camelot is a story about the Irish, about the British kings, uh, and in many ways, the story of the Kennedy starts by being oppressed by, by the English in Ireland. And in fact, Patrick Kennedy, who came to the United States uh, around 1848, it was, uh, came to Boston, but he, he came there because the family farm uh, had been taken over by the British. And really the story of the Kennedys begins with the 800 year uh, oppression of the British in Ireland, uh, much of it based upon religion. So all of these things uh, were, got me interested in doing that book. And also I, I believe that when we look at the backgrounds of presidents, you know, some historians will do kind of a, a amateur psychoanalysis of, of often a Freudian analysis uh, that was very prevalent in, uh, maybe about 50 years ago with characters like uh, Richard Nixon, for instance. There were a lot of uh, books that kind of tried to psychoanalyze Richard Nixon and such. But I think when you look at the cultural background of presidents, particularly if they come from a, minor from a minority standpoint, uh, like Kennedy did, uh, I think you can look at their their religion, their cultural background, their ethnicity, uh, their sense of status in society. Where are, are they the outsiders or were they, uh, 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 did they enjoy uh, a level of privilege above other people, other classes and such. But uh, particularly religion and ethnicity was something that I thought was really lacking in telling the Kennedy story. So when you looked at, when I looked at it from that standpoint, uh, there were a lot, a lot of new and rich veins of information and understanding about uh, JFK and about his family that I, I think uh, yielded a lot of new information and made that book, I think, a very uh, big success. It's still on sale at the JFK Library. I want to um, ask what some of those interesting things that you found were, because I think I didn't really notice that JFK really embraced his Irish heritage that much. I, I, I knew the Catholic angle, but it, the Irish thing does not get talked about at all. No, it doesn't. And, you know, to some extent, uh, back in the 60s, fundamentally, the press corps was fundamentally 
a waspy group of people. It was male, all men, primarily all male. Uh, and um, and the idea in our society of, of separation of church and state, very appropriately. So that's one of the reasons why the religious freedom is a, a thing that uh, attracted a lot of people to this country over the years. But the way the press would cover Kennedy, uh, there was a big effort not to, uh, they just didn't deal with his, his, his ethnicity or his religion. Um, as I mentioned, his religion was the number one issue of that campaign. And what, is, you know, what does it mean to be a Catholic and such? I think that was also interesting in the context of JFK. But as far as his ethnicity, uh, about six months before JFK uh, died, before he was killed, uh, he went to Berlin, as I think a lot of people remember. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, and he gave a, a famous speech at Berlin. But he insisted before he comes back to the United States, after being in Berlin, he insisted on going on a trip to Ireland. And he stopped in Ireland and it was a glorious trip. And JFK felt it was the highlight of his presidency. And when he came back, he would show movies from that trip to Ireland uh, to his family at the White House and such. Teddy Kennedy talked about it uh, a great deal. That was Jack's favorite moment. Um, uh, years later, Jackie took the kids back to Ireland. But you know, what, one of the things that JFK did on that trip, he went to the Kennedy homestead, uh, which is uh, just south of Dublin uh, in uh, County Wexford, it's called, a uh, little small village called Dungenston. And that's where Patrick Kennedy began uh, back in the 1840s when he left Ireland, that's where he left from. And, but uh, Kennedy's cousins still, still work that farm. And uh, back in 1948, Jack Kennedy, when he was uh, over in uh, England and in Ireland, he stopped in Ireland. His sister had a, a castle. She had married into a, a very wealthy family and he was staying in a castle there. And they went down to see uh, Jack and uh, Pamela Churchill. They went in a car and they drove down to the farm and they visited uh, the Kennedy homestead. And when I did my research, I visited, uh, the Kennedys who live at that farm. And uh, they were very helpful. And I got a lot of insights about the Kennedys who stayed behind in Ireland, what their life was like. And, and so it really reflected a lot. And, and both Joe Kennedy, when he was the ambassador to England, he went over to Ireland to visit the Kennedy homestead. Uh, that happened in the 40s, the 1940s. But um, when Jack Kennedy was president of the United States, he went back and he gave a big kiss to his cousin who ran that farm. And that was on the front page of the New York Times in 1963. It was June of 1963. And you can just go and anybody can you know, look that up in the New York Times. I was wondering about the connectivity. I mean, you got to think now you have a cousin that's the president of the United States and he's still taking trips back to Ireland to go visit his cousins. You know, I mean, there could be resentment from a father, you know, moving his whole family or leaving part of the family in Ireland and moving to another country or something like that. I mean, that's interesting. I didn't know about those connections still. Yeah, well, you know, uh, when when Patrick Kennedy left in 1840s, that was uh, late for, uh, back off 1848, I believe it was. Um, you had the famine, really what a lot of Irish historians call the starvation in which um, uh, a lot of the, uh, the foodstuffs of, of meats and other vegetables and such, uh, they would go over to England. In many ways, uh, Ireland was the breadbasket for London in, uh, during that time period, but also uh, the main source of food for the Irish was the potato. And there was a, uh, there was a, uh, uh, problem, uh, an infestation into the uh, potato crops that rendered them uh, incapable of being eaten. Uh, and so there was a famine, a starvation, because the primary food uh, 
that the that the uh, the Irish were were uh, eating was not available. The, the other food that was grown and and raised uh, cattle and or you know other sheep and such uh, that was sent off to England, but um, the the famine is what uh, really pushed about almost half the population of Ireland uh, was reduced in a matter of about 10 years or so because of the famine. A lot of people wound up leaving, going to the United States, going to Canada. And one of those people was Patrick Kennedy. He was the third son in a family where the, uh, the older uh, siblings stayed and they worked the farm, but he had no real future. And so he went over to Liverpool he took a boat from uh, the Wexford area, and then he went over to uh, Liverpool in England, where the Beatles are from. And that was a common way in which a lot of people who were migrating, uh, looking for work and, and leaving, and they were immigrants, uh, and would go to Liverpool. And then they would get on larger ships and go to the United States, Boston, New York, other places in the States or in Canada. There was a number of Irish who went to Canada as well. And so Patrick winds up coming to the United States in 1848. He, he was in Liverpool for about six months, just working to raise enough money to come to the United States. And he arrives and he becomes a migrant uh, worker. He becomes a, a laborer. It was the lowest of the low, uh, you know, in terms of the status of, of, of people in Boston in that time period. To be Irish Catholic and to be a, a laborer was on the lowest socioeconomic scale. Uh, and he, he lived there for about eight years. Uh, he fell in love with a woman named Bridget, uh, whose last name escapes me right now, but Bridget Kennedy, his wife, uh, and he they had some children, but uh, Patrick, died within, within about eight years in the United States. So it was really Bridget who brought up uh, the, uh, particularly uh, the, uh, what, what was JFK's grandfather. Uh, uh, he, he, he and his mother created a tavern uh, in the Boston area. And that kind of became the impetus for the family uh, fortune in a way, uh, because uh, from there, JFK's father, Joseph Kennedy, uh, he went to, he wound up going to Harvard. He was one of the few uh, Irish Catholics who went to Harvard during that time period. Uh, that would have been uh, like the uh, 1910s, 1920s, I think it was. And uh, Joe Kennedy played on the uh, baseball team uh, for Harvard. But he was a really bright guy and he was really good with numbers and money. Uh, by the age of 25, Joe Kennedy became the first bank, the youngest bank president, uh, not only in Massachusetts, but he claimed, I think, in the United States. Uh, and he met the mayor's daughter, Rose, uh, and they got married. And so they, they had uh, nine children, I believe it was. Uh, the Kennedys, and uh, the the second oldest son was John F. Kennedy, uh, and he was born in 1917. Uh, so, excuse me, uh, Joe Kennedy, I think, was earlier at, at Harvard, but uh, off the top of my head. But uh, JFK was born in 1917. He had an older brother, uh, Joe Jr., uh, a few years older than he. But that was the beginning, if, if you will, of the Kennedy story. When it comes to after learning the, I guess the, the cultural background of JFK and his whole family, I mean, did that give you new insight on who this person was? Cause I'm already thinking like, I always knew Kennedy to be raised in a family of money. And you kind of learn a little bit before that about their migration over to another country. And you realize they kind of started with nothing and then had to build up. I mean, Kennedy might've had some money, but his family didn't. His family was not like just constantly handed down with a gold spoon or anything. Yeah, absolutely. It was Joe Kennedy that really had the, he, he's one of those rare people who on Wall Street have the golden fingertips, if you will. Uh, he was, uh, 
uh, he was just on the border of legality, but he, you know, he was a, a speculator on Wall Street. He wound up becoming a movie producer uh, out in Hollywood for a time period, made a lot of money with that. Uh, one of the things I later explore in one of my other books is that uh, after Prohibition, he got the British liquor rights and he made money off of that. But the, uh, also he made a lot of money through real estate. Uh, uh, one of the, big, the biggest uh, commercial building in Chicago is the Merchandise Mart. And that was actually recommended to him by a, a real estate uh, guru for the uh, Archdiocese of New York, a guy named Reynolds, who said to Joe, who was then living in New York, saying, you know, this building is available. Uh, uh, this is right after World War II and he, uh, out in Chicago called the Merchandise Mart. And Joe invested in that. And that actually was probably the best investment, the most lucrative uh, investment he ever made and such. But he was a brilliant businessman. There was no, no doubt about that. Uh, and he, was, he really set the, the standards for his children. When did it... So this got you leading, like, what made you decide to write another book about the Kennedys after learning their background? You just picked up an interest in the Kennedys in general and thought that they have way more to look into. And that's the same thing with me. Um, mostly, I focus around his policies and a lot of the stuff that John F. Kennedy did. I never even really looked into his family a whole lot. Well, um, you know, in the life of a, a writer, uh, you it's sometimes you do things by by. Uh, very clear decisions and such. And sometimes ideas fall out of the sky or, or fundamentally you're, you're talking to people and suddenly something hits you and you say, oh, that would be interesting. Well, after I did that first Kennedy book, and that was fundamentally about how their, their Irish Catholic immigrant experience uh, uh, impacted and influenced their public and private lives. And there was a lot that I could talk to about just about that. But the second book, uh, in between those books, I did a book about uh, Masters and Johnson, the, uh, the sex researchers that got married. Uh, that book called Masters of Sex uh, became uh, the basis for the Showtime Emmy award-winning series uh, that was on Showtime for four seasons. And so that certainly, uh, I was, I was a, a producer of that that show, but it was, it was something that very much uh, 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 demanded my attention. But uh, during that time period, I was talking with a, a doctor who had worked with Masters and Johnson, very bright guy who went to Harvard and, as well. And he said, um, uh, did you see something uh, in the New Yorker about Ch Winston Churchill? And I said, oh yeah, I read that. And we were just chatting I mean, we, we sometimes we talk about the New York Knicks or about the Jets, the football team. But in this conversation, we talked about Churchill. And I said, yeah, uh, I said, you know, Churchill was very good friends with the Kennedys. And this fellow said, well, no, that's not true, Tom. Uh, everybody knows that Joe Kennedy was an isolationist very much against the war and that Winston hated the Joe Kennedy because he opposed uh, the America coming into the war and, and joining uh, and saving uh, Great Britain in World War II. So they were very much at loggerheads. They didn't like each other. And I said, that's true. But before that, in the 30s, uh, they, they, they had a lot of inter, interconnecting friends and business relationships. So they actually were friendly in the early 30s. Uh, and even when Joe Kennedy became the US ambassador and uh, in 38, he came over to the United States. Initially, they were still very friendly and the families knew each other and such. Um, it was only the war. So I, I said, I, you know, in, in, in talking about this, I said, well, that would be a really interesting book about the relationship of the, the Kennedys and the Churchill families and how essentially they were friendly. Then they had this very bitter divide during World War II. But then 20 years later, the second generation, Randolph Churchill, which was, he was the only uh, son of Winston Churchill, 
became very good friends with JFK and Jackie and how, in fact, in 1963 or 62, I guess it was, uh, no, 63, um, JFK actually gave honorary citizenship to Winston Churchill at a Rose Garden ceremony. Uh, and so I had an arc to this book, if you will, where they were friendly, then they had a bitter divide, and then they became friends once again. Uh, and in doing so, I was able to deal with all the different ex uh, experiences that they had in, in London, and particularly the buildup to World War II and the war itself, in which was very dramatic, very traumatic, uh, in which Jack Kennedy is very severely uh, injured. Randolph Churchill is severely injured. Uh, Joe Kennedy is killed. And uh, uh, Kick Kennedy, Kathleen Kennedy, the oldest daughter, her husband is also killed in World War II. So it was an incredibly tragic event for the families and such. And uh, one of the things I've learned to do is to look at things like mass cards and sympathy notes, because people do say, particularly back then, you know, before Twitter reduced us to like two lines and whatever, people used to write letters and cards and they really would pour out their feelings in a way that um, is surprising, particularly when you look at it from a researcher. So I learned from the first book to look at those type of uh, documents if they're available. And then luckily with the Kennedys, uh, a lot of their documents are available at the JFK library. So I would look at not only the official documents that everybody else was looking at, but I tried to look at the key events in their lives and what they were saying privately to one another and the, the references that they had and such. And I thought that made them come alive much more as people. Uh, it provided a lot more insight to what, how they viewed the world and what they considered to be important. And most importantly, when they had moments of great crisis in their lives, tragedy, and certainly the Kennedys had more than their share of tragedy in their lives. It, it helped provide an understanding of how they dealt with it, what was their touch points uh, uh, about uh, uh, God and, and, and their place in the world and such. Uh, and it provided a lot more insight, I think, into them as human beings then you might get from a, a more secularized, more public document driven history. Uh, and so I think um, my books have been much more uh, full bodied and provide a lot more insight into these folks, uh, not only with their public decisions, but in their private lives. When we talk about the separation that you mentioned with the Churchill family, do you know what led up to that separation? Was that just a political divide or was that something? Okay. Yeah, it was very much over World War II. Uh, Winston, in, in a nutshell, uh, was probably the premier figure that saved civilization as we know it. Um, it, it unless you really study that period, the existential threat of Hitler was far greater than what Putin, at least at this stage, uh, poses uh, with the war in Ukraine. But uh, for today's eyes and today's audience, um, Hitler was Putin on steroids, if you will. Um, and, uh, he, and he had taken up almost all of Europe. Uh, there was a big concern about uh, whether or not Hitler would soon invade uh, Great Britain, England, take over London and such. There was a lot of bombing already by the Nazis of, of London. And the, the British were at, they were at war for almost two years before Pearl Harbor uh, came. There was a very strong isolationist movement here in the United States. And so, um, and the Kennedys, Joe Kennedy was part of that isolationist movement. He felt that this was going to be World War I all over again with World War II, uh, and that we shouldn't get involved in it. And he advised that to the President of the United States at the time, Franklin Roosevelt. But he also was the father of, of sons of, of draft age, or they, they enrolled, they enlisted in, in, in the, in the uh, military. But um, he accurately 
uh, feared that his kids would get killed in a war. And his, his family, for all of this money, uh, clearly his family, a family of nine kids, uh, was the center stage of Joe Kennedy's life. Um, John Kennedy has this transformation. People mentioned that ran on the platform of a cold warrior, and then he had this real change. And I always go, there's got to be something more than just going there and seeing things for yourself like J uh, Jack was doing. There's got to be something else there. And kind of you explaining a little bit about his background, a lot of the issues and a lot of things that are going on with his family. You start kind of learning, like he's definitely open to change. You know, you don't just go over to a place, see something. You would have a completely different reaction. Like if you see a butterfly get missed by a car, you could look at it like, okay, that was, um, that was close for that butterfly. Or you could look at it like that's a sign from God or something. And he obviously experienced something in his life that left him to this openness of changing his perspective, which we see later in his administration. Well, this is, again, why it's so important to understand his background. Um, the Catholic Church in 1940s, the 30s and the 40s, with the rise of Mussolini in Italy, uh, fascism in Italy, hmm, sounds familiar these days, doesn't it? And, uh, and then, of course, Hitler in Germany. Um, as much as that worried the Vatican, the Catholic Church at that time period, one of the things that they were even more worried about was the way in which the Soviets, the communists, literally uh, just took apart the church. They dismantled the churches. Um, somebody like Mussolini kind of allowed churches and such. So, you know, people like the, the people in the Vatican, the church had seen characters like these, like a Mussolini many times before various different despots during the 2000 year history of the church. But communism uh, was literally, was a godless approach that was uh, taking apart the churches. And uh, Joe Kennedy was very much involved with the Vatican during that time period. He was in many ways the liaison for the president of the United States, Roosevelt, and the Vatican during that time period. And there's a lot of documents at the JFK Library, particularly between a guy who was the right-hand man of the Pope, Count Enrico Galeazzi, who became a very good friend of Joe Kennedy's uh, and was a, a constant in his life. Um, so to understand the church's role in World War II and Joe Kennedy's, that's the world JFK came into. Um, Bobby Kennedy uh, was very much against the communists in the 50s and such. Uh, and also, when you look at DM. Uh, who was the president in, in South Vietnam uh, lead, during the Vietnam War. Uh, Diem was a Catholic. Uh, there was only about 10% of, of the population in Vietnam was uh, Catholic. But I think that, so the whole idea of the Catholics view of communism as something terrible in, in a nutshell. They thought it was anti-religious. As godless, as taking apart, as an existential threat to the church. That's the background of the Kennedys. So to your point about how it changed, well, I think the, the uh, nuclear showdown during the Cuban Missile Crisis was something that uh, uh, made a big change in JFK's perspective and realizing that we could, uh, if provoked, we could wind up in a nuclear confrontation that would kill literally millions of people. Uh, and when you study the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, you realize that, that we came very close to the brink of nuclear destruction. And uh, from that, he realized that uh, somehow, some way, we have to make a better world uh, and try to uh, deal with it from that, that standpoint. But like I said, to understand Kennedy's background, his cultural background, is to understand why he was such a strong anti-communist. Uh, and I, I think you even see that to some extent in Joe Biden. Uh, Biden sees Putin for who and what he is. Uh, he's basically an old Soviet. He's, a, he's fundamentally comes out of that communist world. Uh, and Biden, as an Irish Catholic, I think, has that understanding of just how terrible communism can be. Did you look into 
Kennedy's administration at all or when Jack became president? Or did you focus maybe more on Bobby? Did you focus on their brother? Or I don't know if it's their brother or if it's their cousin who was the governor, Edward? Uh, well, the, the, the brother, Ted Kennedy, was a U.S. senator from Massachusetts, and he took over the seat that JFK had been in uh, when he got elected. Pre when John Kennedy got elected president, he was the he was a senator from Massachusetts. He was elected in 1952, and he served until he got elected as president in 1960. There was a there was uh, another fellow who was, was senator for about two years, but in 62, Ted Kennedy, who was then in his 30s, was elected as the senator from Massachusetts in that seat and that his brother used to have. And he was in that seat until he died in 2008, I think it was, is when he died, maybe 2009. I think it's 2008. Um, and so, um, you know, that uh, in many ways, that was almost like the family seat there. But Massachusetts had a very strong affinity to the cap to uh, the, to the Kennedys, and a lot of them are Irish Catholic up there, and, and so I think there was a lot of pride, particularly in, in JFK's uh, great success as, as president. As a culture icon, but when it comes to Kennedy's administration, did you focus on anything about in Kennedy's administration? Yeah, just to go back there, um, in the first book that I did, Kennedy, uh, the Kennedys. Uh, America's Emerald Kings, I looked at a, a lot of things that I tried to look at things that have not been looked at. One of the biggest things, and arguably the biggest legacy of JFK to, 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 to today's America, has, it, it stems back from a little small book that JFK published in 1958, it was called A Nation of Immigrants. And it's almost like a pamphlet size, but it was fundamentally talking about the history of immigration in this country. And it was really a salute to immigration. It had a lot of pictures of people from all around the world who had come to the United States. And um, JFK felt very strongly that, uh, that the laws that were passed in the 1920s were very restrictive uh, about immigration. And he felt that, um, that, that uh, America should live up to its promise of, of being a haven for immigrants who come here legally, but, uh, but who come here from all around the world and add to the richness and the vibrancy of this country. And so that he published that in 1958 uh, and didn't get a lot of attention, a lot of, hist a lot of historians who write about JFK. Never even mentioned that book, which is amazing to me. But that book became the impetus for a change in the immigration law that John F. Kennedy proposed in 1963, roughly the same time that he proposed a change in the civil rights legislation uh, and getting rid of Jim Crow and, and attempts to do that. But the change, the, the immigration law that, that he proposed he did that just before he was assassinated. And in 1965, in honor of JFK, and, and uh, that, that bill was passed by Congress, signed into law in 1965 by, by President Johnson, who took over as the vice president, took over from JFK after he was assassinated. Johnson signed into law the Immigration Act of 1965. And now as we look back, you know, more than 50 years later. That act, 1965 Immigration Act, really opened up the door, the door to many immigrants, not only from Latin America, but from Eastern Europe, from Asia, from uh, Southeastern Asia, uh, a lot of people, uh, and even places from Vietnam, as example, after the war, a number of people who came here. So uh, when we look at the new America that we live that we live in that's much more diverse than America was in 1965. Uh, a lot of that is uh, the result of the 1965 Immigration Act, the vision of a nation of immigrants and the subsequent uh, rules that have been and regulations that have resulted from that 1965 Act. That really changed America. America that we live in today is really a consequence of JFK's 
vision of the nation of immigrants. It's in that little small pamphlet that became his the law that he that he uh, proposed that was passed after his assassination in his in his honor, and it really defines the America that we live in today. Well, it makes the argument for why he's a cultural icon today as well, too. I mean, he did a lot of revolutionary things. That's why a lot of people think that, you know, it was the government that took him out. I mean, a government was not thinking like JFK. He experienced real change. He did a lot of things. He even talked about scattering the CIA into a thousand pieces of dust into the wind. You know, he trusted his brother. His brother was an advisor to him as well, too. I mean, it's a whole family, basically a bond that really can't be broken in so many aspects. And it was new to the White House. That was it's never really been done before like that. Yeah, well, I, I did write a third book um, uh, about kind of about the Kennedys. They're kind of uh, they're secondary figures, but it, it's fundamentally about the CIA. The book is called Mafia Spies, and it's about two gangsters two mobsters who uh, were hired by the CIA in 1960 uh, to assassinate Fidel Castro. And it tells the story of what happened there. So the, the book is about, about the two gangsters and these two, they were friends and buddies, if you will, uh, in their life. And so it does talk about the influence of organized crime, places like Chicago, Las Vegas and in Hollywood as well, uh, and also down in Florida. It also talks about the CIA. Uh, this was a plan that actually started under Eisenhower. Nobody knew about it, but it was a. It was a. Uh, Is this the was, S team uh, or I'm, Operation Forty? I, I can't hear you. I'm the sorry. S team or Operation Forty? Yeah, no, no, no. This this was a a, a separate plan that the CIA had. Uh, that uh, dealt with, uh, essentially, they, they, they wanted to insulate themselves. Uh, and so they had a cutout, it's what they call it, a cutout, a buffer, if you will, between the CIA. You know, CIA was all these guys who had gone to Ivy League schools like Yale and, and Princeton. So they wanted to get, they wanted to kill Castro, but they didn't want to say kill or assassinate. They, they wanted to get rid of a problem or liquidate or eliminate a problem. And what they did was they wanted to, they didn't want to get their hands dirty. They didn't want the agency to get their hands dirty in doing this. And so what they did was they hired uh, these two mobsters through a, through a go-between, uh, a cutout, a guy who uh, was uh, a fixer, if you will. And, and he dealt with the mob, but he also dealt with at times with the CIA. And he lined up these two gangsters who felt it would be in their interest to, to do a favor for the CIA and getting rid of Castro. And the reason why they also wanted to get rid of Castro is because when Castro came to power in 1959, he threw out the mob. The mob was running big, big casinos in Havana. It's hard to imagine, but from like 1930s through 1959, Havana was a was a bigger place. It was than Las Vegas. Las Vegas really didn't get off the ground until after World War II. But on the East Coast, uh, people wanted to go into the sun and and gamble and go to see floor shows, very big floor shows and such. Um, they would go to Havana rather than Las Vegas. Las Vegas was not quite the Las Vegas that we know of. Uh, today. So even like singers like Tony Bennett, uh, uh, back in the day, very young Tony Bennett, he would, he would perform down in Havana. It was a big, big thing. And the mob owned virtually all of the casinos in cahoots with the dictatorship down in Havana. When, so when Castro comes in, he throws out everybody, all of the casino owners. And so the mob was really upset. They wanted to get rid of Castro as well. They felt that they got rid of Castro, uh, they would be able to restore their very lucrative casinos. So um, th that was the equation in Mafia Spies. It's the CIA wants to get rid of C Castro, hiring two guys, two mobsters, who they want to get rid of Castro for their own reasons. Uh, and then what happened there? And the story is really fascinating. Both gangsters wind up uh, uh, eventually getting murdered themselves. 
and who did it is still a big question mark. So it was kind of a murder mystery. It was a, a, a book about the mob, but fundamentally it's a spy book and, and about the CIA and how things were carried out and about assassination. Uh, and it's about violence, uh, the violence of state, sponsor, state, excuse me, state sponsored uh, uh, violence of assassinations, but also the mob, how it would carry out uh, violence for business reasons, you know, economic reasons, but also they would hire nut jobs, basically psychopaths, people who would be enforcers, who just like killing, who like violence. The mafia is a very violent world. Uh, the obsession with guns and the use of guns and such. So the uh, mafia spies is a lot about violence. Uh, and as well, and all its all its different types of violence. And after having just done a book about love and sex with Masters of Sex, I went I went to the complete opposite spectrum. Uh, and so that was part of the appeal as a writer in telling that story. Were you surprised about the connection with organized crime, the CIA and mafia? I know that was a surprise to me when I started learning about that in the Kennedy assassination. Just so many. Yeah, it's it's totally outrageous. It's totally outrageous. Um, and the people who sanctioned it, uh, Alan Dulles, who was the head of the CIA, Eisenhower apparently had uh, sanctioned it. Uh, that's been said now and pretty clearly, uh, pretty clearly proven <clears throat> just before he left office that Eisenhower signed off on this plan and it was carried through during the early years of the Kennedy administration. Um, and so it really was going on up until JFK's death and such there was attempts to uh, overthrow and or assassinate, kill uh, Castro. Uh, so yeah, I was, I was really surprised uh, by that, I think everybody. And it, 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 it was such a secret, it, it remains a secret for about 15 years after the fact. It didn't come out until the mid 1970s, the number of, the number of hearings uh, th that the Senate had, the House had, uh, there was a special commissions that was set up that examined the CIA and, and, and there was a real cleaning up of the CIA. And, um, you know, with, when it comes to spying historically, there's often been a debate about, is it, uh, are, is your spy agency an intelligence gathering operation, or they, do they get involved in covert operations as well? In other words, do we just collect information and have spies that are in other countries to find out what's going on just so that we are informed about things? Or do we also send out agents to make things happen, to provoke overthrows, to provoke uh, or even be involved in assassination attempts. And that's that's known as the covert area of, of spying. Well, that's and, what they found out in the Watergate trials when they were they opened up the wasp nest of all the covert operations because that's what they were worried about. They weren't necessarily worried about, about what independent like Nixon or anybody was doing. They just wanted to know what how many covert ops are you guys running and there's a long, dirty list that they found as well, too. And then we're still, you know, learning stuff more about history and parts of that. I mean, MK Ultra was something that was labeled a conspiracy for a long time. And then you find out Alan Dulles is in charge of that. And you're like, oh, my goodness. Like, I, Kennedy's administration had to know about it. And the mob gets brought up a lot. But I just try and look back. When did this organized crime, this mafia connection first start? That had to go it had to be there for a while because they had it narrowed down to a science. Well, during World War II, uh, there is uh, some uh, historical research that indicates that um, the mob would be approached as a source of information for the intelligence world and things of that nature. But it wasn't until this, <clears throat> what I talk about with mafia spies in 1960, where there actually are essentially hiring mobsters to be the arm, the unofficial arm of the CIA, of the government. That's where we cross the Rubicon, where we, it's really the first 
known uh, attempt to assassinate another foreign leader uh, by this country. I mean, we really cross the Rubicon about this. And in fact, when Al Alan Dulles is uh, essentially fired by JFK because of the, the disaster with the Bay of Pigs uh, attack early in JFK's administration, he replaces uh, Alan Dulles with a fellow named John McComb. And McComb also was Catholic, by the way. And he, he made it known that he didn't want to hear anything about assassination. He said, I would be excommunicated from my church if it, if it was found out that I was involved in killing somebody. So what did they do in the CIA? They already had this thing going on when McCone comes in uh, and they continued. They just didn't tell him. They just didn't tell uh, John McCone, the head of the CIA, uh, about what was going on with the CIA with uh, trying to kill Castro. It was, it was maintained as a secret by Richard Helms, who later became the head of the CIA, but he was a rung down from McCone. Um, and by people like uh, William Harvey was the direct uh, dealer of uh, with uh, the, the mafia guys that were down in Florida, working with the Cuban exiles, uh, planning to try to kill and replace Castro in, 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 in Cuba. Also, just out of fairness, uh, fairness uh, it should be said that um, Castro was a nut. Castro was a despot. I know there are some people who said, well, he had good health care and whatever. Okay. But fundamentally, he had firing squads where he closed down the press, where they had firing squads killing dissidents. Um, he had a, uh, essentially a gulag that, was, uh, that he learned at the hand of the Soviets there. And so, and, and, and he is, as the Human Rights Watch has said, uh, he was the purveyor of many abuses of human rights for many, many years. So he was an existential, he was real, a, a really a provocateur in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Even Khrushchev, who was the head of the Soviet Union back then, he essentially criticized Castro uh, for being a, a guy who wanted to essentially uh, provoke World War III, a, a nuclear annihilation. And he had a, Khrushchev had to point out to Castro that if there was such a thing as World War III, that you, Cuba, would be a, a pile of dust. You'd be the first one to go. Um, so the, uh, the craziness of Castro, he was crazy like a fox on one level. Uh, you know, I mean, that's how he managed to survive. But he, uh, he was very much seen as a very dangerous radical who is only 90 miles from our shore. And that's the way, the way that we are, our society, uh, our, the American culture in the last 20 years, looked at somebody like Osama bin Laden as a big threat. Nowhere close was he a threat compared to Castro uh, back in the 1960s. Um, it, it, was, it was perceived that not only would, Cas would Cuba become communist, but the Soviets intended on making all of Latin America uh, part of their sphere of influence, not unlike what Hitler wanted to do. Uh, and that was a big fear in World War II that Latin America uh, and some of the countries there would go uh, align themselves with the Nazis. So, um, you know, there are some very good reasons why people were very alarmed about Fidel Castro. I get like the propaganda aspects of maybe weaponizing a certain people. So it's justified to take somebody out. But in some aspects, I mean, a lot of aspects, Castro was not exactly a good guy. You know, like I'm not defending him at all either. But um, what I was interested in was hearing Jack Kennedy finally make backdoor deals or backdoor you know, talks with Khrushchev and then reaching out to Castro to do the same. But also, if you look into Kennedy, Kennedy also didn't care if the assassination attempts worked or they didn't. He was trying to create two paths. He kind of looked at Castro like, maybe I'll try and reach out and see if I can get something going. But, you know, if the assassination attempts, you know, work and we get someone else that we like in there, it was just interesting to see that because, I mean, a lot of presidents wouldn't do that. A lot of presidents back then would have just been like, we're going to go to war. We're going to go straight to this. And we see that even after. 
But Kennedy was reaching out. He was reaching out to Khrushchev and after Khrushchev called him a pushover, basically. And there was a lot of stuff where it was like, man, seeing this whole thing start to connect and it looked like the first glimmer of kind of like peace. I mean, him, him saying, I'd rather my kids be red than dead. I mean, the idea of being soft on communism is not something you wanted to be back then. But this idea of what it meant in the overall run was not just a piece in our time, but a piece in all time. And that's I mean, that's very, very powerful. I think that's why a lot of people are interested in learning about him. And some people get interested in his assassination and wondering why it's he, he was saying such great things. And I'm not I don't know Kennedy. Like I'm not a, a, a hater of him. I'm not a lover of him either. I'm just l- trying to learn all aspects of his life. And overall, you start realizing the change that a person has. And even Johnson, I think. And trust me, Johnson gets brought up a lot in the assassination. Not people do not like him. But if you look at the ending of his, you know, his, you know, presidency, he did experience change too. he got his hair a lot longer. He started growing it out a little bit. And it's like you start realizing these, you know, change in people. You get to see it visibly. And we see it now with the president. They get gray hair when they, you know, when they get out of it. And it's like seeing that change in real time, especially when it comes to their whole mindset and attitude um, during their presidency is pretty powerful stuff. I I think the biggest change uh, of all the people that I wrote, have written about in the Kennedy world happened with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, he was much more of a hawkish character uh, pr- during his uh, brother's administration, particularly as the attorney general. He was, uh, people who would read my book, Mafia Spies, will find that he was a very active agent in overseeing what was going down on, going on down in Florida, uh, where uh, the CIA was running essentially an undeclared war inside the United States uh, aimed at uh, trying to overthrow and or assassinate Fidel Castro. And Bobby Kennedy, who was then the attorney general, was in essence the top spy as well, overseeing what was going on in Florida. After his brother's assassination, though, Bobby Kennedy soon leaves um, as attorney general. He runs for senator in New York in 1964. And there's a dramatic change in Bobby Kennedy uh, that you see in him personally, uh, his, uh, his view about uh, being more empathetic as a human being. I think he changed it personally there, the suffering that he had gone through in seeing with his brother's death and what had happened and such uh, weighed heavily on him. But it also, uh, in terms of his policies, I think he became really the kind of progressive Democrat that we see in today's uh, political spectrum. And he saw the political coalitions of Blacks, Hispanics, women, people uh, from uh, various different minorities coalescing around around, uh, a candidacy such as his. And uh, when he was killed in 1968, actually that, 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 uh, election of the primary in California when he won the presidential primary in 1968 out in California, that that victory and his coalition kind of represented that new uh, America, that new, uh, uh, um, again, coalition that the Democrats have uh, put together and have, has been successful subsequently by other candidates over the last 50 years, 60 years. Well, um, like I said, I think Bobby Kennedy is a topic I'm going to get into hopefully later down the road. I got to learn all about his whole change and his whole policies, especially even before his brother was even assassinated and then obviously leading into his assassination as well. But I really appreciate the time you've given me to talk on my show and help me learn more about just Kennedy's life and background in general. Like I said, a lot of researchers don't talk about that. They don't talk about a few things I feel like are important to get the overall idea and message and kind of understanding of who this person was, who's, you know, a lasting figure today in our history. But um, is there a place where people can find any of your links and your books as well, too? Yeah, I I would imagine that uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to Amazon. Or you could go to your local bookstore and ask them for the book if they don't already have it. Hopefully, they already have it on their shelves and just hand it to you. Um, and um, if you if you visit the JFK Library, you'll find my books there. Um, and um, I think it's a really good gift <clears throat> to give to anybody, be it the holidays or you know 
uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day and such. But uh, my books can be found just about anywhere. Well, I'll make sure I link all your links in the description. I appreciate the time uh, chat with me on my show. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank.